My name is Ken Paller, and I'm going to be moderating today's Cognitive Science Dialogue. We're here to discuss a question that I think is at the foundation of cognitive science, how, um, how can human consciousness be understood? And we're very fortunate to have two speakers with us today uh, in a debate-like format. Uh, we'll have first Alan Wallace and then John Searle. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Cognitive Science Program for sponsoring this event. We hold these Cognitive Science Dialogues roughly every year, and um, in fact, this is the fourth time in recent years that we've covered the topic of consciousness in one way or another. It's obviously a very important topic. Um, now, we're also holding a reception, which will be in the next room, and you're all invited for that at 6 o'clock. Then at 7 o'clock, I'd like to uh, let you know that there will also be a fur further opportunity for Cognitive Science students and others to hold a little discussion uh, over pizza. And then one other event I'd like to announce now is on Saturday, there'll be a talk by Alan Wallace, sponsored by the Chicago Tibet Center. And that will be uh, titled, What Makes a Life Meaningful? A, a Buddhist View. And that's going to be 4 to 6 PM tomorrow in room 107 Swift Hall, which is a short walk north of here. And um, there's some flyers posted outside about that if you need some more information. OK. Um, now let me tell you about the format of today's program. We're going to have each speaker take about 25 to 30 minutes to make a presentation. First, Alice with a view, uh, first uh, Alan Wallace with a view from the east, and then John Searle with a view from the west. And then each speaker will have time for a rebuttal, and after that, we'll be opening the floor uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, before all that, I'm going to take about 10 minutes to share a little bit of my point of view and tell you why I decided to invite these two speakers here to Northwestern to discuss consciousness in the first place. Uh, Perhaps at the root of some of the difficulty of dealing with consciousness is um, this uh, idea from a Western philosophy known as the mind-body problem, the tremendous difference there is between two things, the uh, things we commonly refer as mental, private, subjective events, and physical things, the physical world. So John Searle's charge today will be to try to describe his approach to this problem, and I'm sure he'll point out that uh, we come to this problem from a Western philosophical tradition, uh, this dualistic perspective of these different ways to think about mental and the physical, uh, strongly in influenced by certain philosophers from the past. I guess to say more would be putting Descartes before the horse, so I'm going to leave that to, to John. But Searle's view is, is that there's really nothing mysterious about consciousness, uh, nothing spooky at all. Uh, Consciousness is caused by neurobiological processes in the brain. It's just a natural biological process, so we shouldn't think about it as if it's something spooky. And really, if you just look at the cover of John Searle's latest book, uh, Mind, you can see right away, nothing spooky here at all. <laughs> Levitation. Um, so, well, how do these issues connect to our contemporary investigations of consciousness in cognitive science uh, and, uh, and also in cognitive neuroscience, where we often uh, take measures of the brain in action and try to relate them to subjective experiences of various sorts, uh, perceptions, uh, vision, sight, memories, emotions, and so forth. Um, well, often we rely on a working hypothesis, some assumption that there are causal relationships between mental phenomena and brain processes. Sometimes we even refer to mind slash brain. And yet, there are many people that have doubts about this agenda no less the editor of Science who recently wrote in an editorial that he thinks it's unlikely that our knowledge about the brain will deepen enough to fuse it with the mind. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. I, I wish I did know. But he seems to be skeptical that we'll ever learn enough about the brain to really understand the mind. Um, and well, certainly, we need more than a bottom-up approach from neuroscience. We also need cognitive analysis. Uh, so we need both cognitive science and neural science. And really, so we somehow need to bring human subjective experience to the table, if that's what we ultimately want to understand. So now let's see what Buddhism might bring to the table, too. The uh, contempl contemplative methods, uh, in fact, re represent an empirical approach to understanding the mind. If you aren't familiar with Buddhism, you might be surprised to know that Buddhists are apparently quite willing to modify their views in the face of empirical evidence. And as the Dalai Lama has stated, Buddhism and science are not conflicting perspectives on the world, but rather differing approaches to the same end to expand our knowledge and understanding. And further, if science proves facts that conflict with Buddhism, Buddhist understanding, then 
Buddhism must change accor accordingly. So certainly there's room here for a dialogue between Buddhism and science. Uh, the term meditation actually refers to a whole set of uh, different methods that involve training the mind. So meditation may help with stress reduction, but that's not really the point here. Rather, we're interested in how people can develop um, some keen abilities to control and monitor understanding their focus of attention uh, and their emotions uh, and, and their whole inner life, really, with many ramifications. Now, in our labs at Northwestern, we're beginning to take note of what can happen in such circumstances. And one reason that's of interest is that we may be able to make use of these expert observations of the mind and perhaps uh, provide some novel perspectives on consciousness. So Alan Wallace's charge today will be to tell us what Buddhist thought has to offer to help us in, in using introspection to gain insight into private subjective experience. Now I'd like to, um, I'd like to also uh, point out one example of potential connections between Buddhism and cognitive science close to home or related to my research uh, in memory. And an, an important topic in memory research is this idea of implicit memory. So that is, memory can influence our behavior in many sorts of ways. And sometimes that happens without our explicit awareness that memory is operative. And that's implicit memory. And there's also parallel implicit phenomena with respect to perception and motions and so on. And we've been able to enhance our understanding of conscious memory by uh, looking at it and inspecting how it differs from various kinds of implicit memory. Uh, implicit memory really isn't the same as the Freudian unconscious that's related. It's uh, also related a bit to this idea from Buddhism of habitual tendencies. Um, the habits and the predilections that largely determine how we act in certain circumstances and, and really how we think. Learning plays a big role in inquiring these uh, tendencies in the first place. It's in a form of implicit memory. And um, psychotherapy, or sometimes we can figure out through psychotherapy or other means how to adjust these tendencies. It's really you know, new kinds of learning, new learning in those cases. So consider this statement from Mathieu Ricard. All thoughts of attachment and aversion arise from previous conditioning. The very, the very goal of the spiritual path is to dissolve these tendencies. So putting this together, it can be useful to uh, understand ways to accomplish this, to try to um, see from many perspectives how conscious experience is influenced by so many things going on below the surface. And I'm optimistic that we may have much to gain by taking all these perspectives together. Uh, well, maybe not so much the Freudian one, but at least the other two. <laughs> um, now, one last quote here from a neuroscientist, uh, the late Francisco Varela, who noted that the future of the mind sciences is one in which we enter into a reshaping of both how it is that we have insights about our own experience and how our own experience shapes the explanations we have of the mind. So really, uh, even further, you could say our own experience of the mind uh, shapes our explanations of the mind, the universe, and everything, really. So this is uh, critical to understand the mind. And Alan Wallace has some perspectives, uh, some very provocative thoughts about how that can be done. So let me introduce him with a brief biography. Alan grew up in Southern California, and then he left for his junior year of college abroad and didn't come back. These college abroad programs are great. He, he was in Germany. He, uh, while, in, while in Europe, he encountered Tibetan Buddhism. He studied the Tibetan language in Germany, went on to a Buddhist monastery in Switzerland, and then he journeyed to India where he spent many years in training as a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Now interestingly, part of the, Tibetan, uh, part of the training that Tibetan Buddhist monks undergo also includes <coughs> debates uh, kind of like what you see here. Turn that off for a second. So you can kind of hear them debating. These are groups of monks debating. And so here you hear two uh, these monks. They're debating in Tibetan, uh, so I can't tell for sure, but you know, perhaps they're, they're debating something about the essential uh, essence of, of the mind, something of that sort. And so today we might have, again, Alan taking a point that he's making to <laughs> Searle. Hopefully Searle isn't pushing back, but Alan will slap his hands in this characteristic when he makes a point to Searle, and then we'll have Searle replying. So. So Alan did that uh, for quite a while, as I understand, among the other uh, training. Now, um, Alan Wallace's great expertise as a scholar and a, as a practitioner 
of Buddhism is evidenced by the many important books he has written or contributed to on these topics. Three of the most recent are Buddhism with an Attitude, the Tibetan Seven Mind Point, uh, Seven Point Mind Training, the Taboo of Subjectivity Toward the Science of Consciousness, and Buddhism and Science Breaking New Ground, and I believe another book coming out in April on, on even more interesting topics as well. Um, but note that Alan's expertise is not limited to Buddhism. In fact, he did come back from India, and he went to Amherst to finish college and get a bachelor's degree in physics and philosophy of mind, no, philosophy of science, excuse me. And his, he later earned a doctorate in religious studies at Stanford, where he wrote on the concept of attention, comparing Eastern and Western points of view. Alan subsequently taught in the Department of Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara and is now president of the Santa Barbara Institute for the Interdisciplinary Study of Consciousness, and he's actively working on several exciting scientific projects. He's also played an important role in the Mind and Life Institute, which is an organization that has instigated many wonderful dialogues between Buddhists and scientists, and so that organization is also indirectly to thank for today's dialogue. So uh, please welcome Alan Wallace here to start things off. Well, I'd like to thank Ken and everybody who worked with him to make possible today's engagement, which I'm very much looking forward to. I'm delighted also that uh, John Searle has been able to join us for this. Uh, very much looking forward to our conversation, whether it's debate or collaboration, we shall see. Um, the topic that I'd like to address today, as you can see from the title, is metacognition. The old term was introspection, uh, which is been so tarnished that I don't use it much anymore, but metacognition is still a scientifically legitimate term, at least the last I heard. So what possible role might there be for metacognition, our direct experience, observation of, and reporting of mental states? This can be a little bit quieter, it'd be good. And, the, and this, how this may pertain to the study of the mind. To place this in a little bit of historical context. To my mind, I think we've had three major revolutions in the history of science since the time of Copernicus. The, one of, the first one, of course, was that of Copernicus, given an enormous amount of uh, momentum by a Galileo, so the Copernican revolution, the initial scientific revolution. And I would suggest among the various key factors that facilitated or enabled this revolution in our understanding of the physical world was the fact that Galileo took a previously discovered or developed device, namely the telescope, refined it, and then used it in unprecedented ways, directly, directing it to the moon, the sun, the stars, the planets, and made a number of observations, really started the science of astronomy. Until then, you had astrology. You had generations and generations of astrologers who were allegedly very ex expert at studying the, the correlates between terrestrial and celestial phenomena. But we'd have to say, at best, they were folk astronomers whereas Galileo brought this fully into the realm of science with the telescope, and of course, there are other aspects as well. But the point of men mentioning this here right now is that in order for there to be astronomy, a scientific study of the, the, of the moon, the, the stars, the, the sun, the planets, and so forth, you must have very rigorous, precise, reliable, penetrating ways of observing the phenomena themselves that are under investigation. Simply studying correlates is inadequate. That leaves you with astrology, but no astronomy. So we had a scientific revolution in the physical sciences. Van Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch, a Dutch researcher, let's call him, used a microscope, used it in unprecedented ways to start observing, making precise observations of minute life forms. He, by himself, just having the microscope, did not initiate a revolution in the life sciences, but that was crucial. It wound up eventually being crucial. A bit lower? Good. Coming on too strong. How is that? Is that better? How is that better? Is that better in the back? Yes? Come see, come see? Okay. I would say the person who really kicked off the revolution in the life sciences was, was of course, Darwin, in terms of fundamentally reorient, reorienting our, our mindset, our view of who we are, where are we in the universe, what's the nature of life, at least on planet Earth, Darwin kicked it off. It wasn't sufficient by himself. He didn't have any exceptional ways of observing living organisms. It took Mendel, 
But that was not sufficient. He also, this, this monk living in Czechoslovakia, started the gen genetics, but it wasn't sufficient. The real revolution in the life sciences, I would suggest, didn't really start making, making hay, so to speak, really get many, making major progress until the 20th century with Crick and Watson in 1952, I think it was, and then really the Genome Project. So as the first revolution in the physical sciences took around 140 years, I would say from the time of Copernicus until Newton's work in Principia, it's about 140 years. You say the revolution's over and now we continue making wonderful progress. I would suggest likewise for the first and only revolution we've had in the biological sciences, it started with Darwin. I would say the revolution itself has come to, come, come, to, come to culmination with the Genome Project. We've had a second one, which I'll allude to only very briefly in the physical sciences. It is the, the physical sciences are the most mature of our sciences. And we've already had a second one uh, out of 400 years of physical sciences. The second one started with Max Planck, Einstein, and company. Again, a radical reorientation about nature of space, time, matter, and energy. It doesn't get more, much more basic than that. That revolution started roughly 100 years ago, has not finished yet. I think it's still in the process of revolting because fundamental issues have not been resolved. The measurement problem, the nature of non-locality, wh whether there even is a quantum world that the quantum, qu quantum mechanics is mapping, very, very uncertain. A great revolution, but we're still seeing it playing itself out. And now we move to the cognitive sciences. The scientific study of the mind began, let's say, in the 1870s. Had generations of philosophers before then, but in terms of a scientific discipline, not really before the 1870s. I would suggest that we still have not had a single revolution there. Despite Howard Gardner's book, which I saw you cited in one of yours, John, uh, The Mind's New Science, A History of the Cognitive Revolution, well, there's been a lot, of re a lot of progress. So I don't mean in any way to disparage or diminish what has happened, especially in the 20th century. But a revolution like the Darwinian Revolution, the Copernican Revolution, the revolution of quantum mechanics and relativity, I don't see it. I don't think we've had one yet. For both the physical sciences and the life sciences, telescope, microscopes, and a myriad of other modes of observation to observe the phenomena themselves, meticulously, probingly, in depth, have been devised. When it comes to mental phenomena, which after all is what the scientific study of the mind should all be about, mental phenomena, and not just their neural and behavioral correlates, what sophisticated methodology do we have for making rigorous, scientific, in-depth observations of mental phenomena? which I think is John Searle, so what rightly says, are irreducibly first person. There has been no such revolution. The, for, as, in terms of means of directly observing mental phenomena, this remains at the level of folk psychology. Again, a brief overview. If you, look, if you try to narrow down your mind to imagine you only know about physics and nothing about biology, I think this is a true statement. I'm happy to have it challenged later when the time comes. But I would suggest, for my own studies in physics, the laws of physics alone, with no knowledge of biology at all, bracketing your mind, they neither predict nor explain the emergence of life in the universe. There's nothing there. If you confine yourself to the tools of physics, and again, bracketed out everything of biology, I would dare say that you cannot even detect the presence of life in the universe confining yourself to the methodologies of physics. You would just see pockets of anti-entropy. But life? I don't think so. They neither predict nor explain. Likewise, the laws of biology. Alone, bracketing everything you know about the mind, bracketing your first-person experience of the mind. Bracket that if you can, which of course you can't. But the laws of biology alone neither predict nor explain the emergence of consciousness. What are its necessary and sufficient causes? Don't know. What's the nature of consciousness? Don't know. What does it do? Don't know. Is it predicted or explained? No. For though there are many who believe that it will, but that is a promissory note which Donald Kennedy doesn't seem to uh, buy into, but many do. So I'll quote my esteemed colleague, John Searle, when he comments the specifically mental aspects of the mind, that which makes them uniquely mind, conscious events, subjective, qualitative, the specifically mental aspects of the mind can be specified, studied, and understood without knowing how the brain works. Even if you are a materialist, you do not have to study the brain to study the mind. And I know a number of psychologists, like Paul Ekman, would go right along with that. That doesn't mean don't study the brain. Why should you? Why should you cut off one of your arms? But the brain alone will not suffice. William James, aware of this about 110 years ago, 
commented, psychology indeed is today hardly more than what physics was before Galileo. Now, of course, that was 110 years ago. I think that was in 1890. But in terms of the direct observation of mental events, I think it's still a fair statement. We don't have a telescope for the mind. John Searle comments, in ways that are not at all obvious on the surface, much of the bankruptcy of most work in the philosophy of mind and a great deal of the sterility of academic psychology over the past 50 years, I think one could say the last 130, have come from a persistent failure to recognize and come to terms with the fact that the ontology of the mental is an irreducibly first-person ontology. A statement that I heartily, heartily endorse. So this brings us to what we can call metacognition. William James called it introspection when that was not yet a dirty word or a disparaged word. And he comments in his masterwork, The Principle of Psychology, introspective observation is what we have to rely on first and foremost and always. The word introspection, or we, we gloss it in modern context, metacognition, need hardly be defined. It means, of course, the looking into our minds and reporting what we there discover. Everyone agrees that we there discover states of consciousness. He did not present introspection as being the sole means, the only or unique means for studying the mind. In fact, he had a very multifaceted approach that I think laid the grounds for what could have been a, rel a revolution in the cognitive sciences. What he was proposing is that while introspection, your, your sole access to mental phenomena themselves, direct access to the phenomena, of emotions, mental imagery, cognition, and so forth and so on, is introspection. Don't confine yourself to that because he said, of course, you want to study the, the causal, the physical causal underpinnings, the physical substrate of mental phenomena, study the brain, for heaven's sakes. And study behavior. So much of our behavior is voluntary, and you can make inferences based upon behavior back to their mental causes. So bracket it. Look at the neural causes, the phenomena themselves by introspection, and the fruits of mental activity in terms of behavior. Bracket it by in terms of cause, nature, and effects. You've got a threefold way to approach the subject, very rich, very, very balanced, and very ignored. It was not pursued. He died in 1911, and about 1910, he was steamrolled by behaviorism, by John Watson and company, who entirely threw out the notion of introspection. And it's never really been revived since. He laid the foundation for a revolution in the cognitive sciences, and it hasn't happened. He wasn't at all naive about introspection. In fact, he was, not a he was mistaken, but he was not naive about many things, as far as I can tell. He comments in terms of introspection, introspection is difficult and fallible, unlike what, at least according to one reading, Descartes would have us to believe that introspection is somehow incorrigible, in, you know, Flawless and, and infallible. And, uh, William James, to the contrary, says it's difficult and it's fallible. However, the difficulty is simply that of all observation of whatever kind. The only safeguard is in the final consensus of our farther knowledge or our later knowledge about the thing in question, later views correcting earlier ones until at last the harmony of a consistent system is reached. Now, especially when the introspection is not working as a lone ranger all by itself, a whole bunch of people in isolation observing their minds and then sharing what, they came, what, they're, what, they're, what, they're, what they're experiencing. But if you draw from the strengths of modern cognitive behavioral psychology, psychophysics, and of course cognitive neuroscience, if you bracket this, and so when a person makes a first person report, you're plotting what's happening in the brain. fMRI, EEG, ERP, maybe PET scans, and some other technologies that have been devised right now. You're also plotting from cognitive behavioral measurements. There's a lot that can be done there. If you're coming in like a checks and balances in the three-part governmental system, then no one has an absolute say. No one speaks with absolute authority. Well, after all, the brain scientist was, must, must really what, know what's going on. But neither give total authority to the introspectionist nor to the behaviorist. But let them all be working in the checks and balances so you can find rigorous correlates from the first person to these three, two third-person modalities. But now if one is going to make introspection or metacognition into a scientifically rigorous mode of observation. You've got to be able to attend to the phenomena in question with stability, which means continuity, coherence, but also vividness, high resolution, clarity, brilliance. Just like Galileo, if you imagine, that if, imagine him 
planting his telescope on the back of a camel in a dust storm, and then trying to make observations. With no stability and no clarity, he's not going to discover the moons of Jupiter. You've got to have stability, you have to have clarity. Likewise, if you're going to try to spect intro, to observe mental states, mental phenomena, imagery, and so forth, and so, there's a, a myriad of phenomena to be investigated, a steady, continuous, and sharply focused, high-resolution, vivid attention is going to be crucial. What William James called sustained voluntary attention. He wrote about it, and I encourage you to seek out his writings on attention, because they're really quite brilliant to this day, and especially his writings on sustained attention. Really are quite breathtaking, to my mind. But having said all of that, and he said a lot, that was very, very provocative, and I think true as well. When it came to the issue of being able to actually develop attention skills, take a person with just normal attention skills, pretty much scatterbrain. Raising the question, is it possible to take, take a such person and through training refine the attention, enhancing stability, enhancing vividness, making this into a really robust way of observing the mind? Well, he was pessimistic. He's writing in 1890. He didn't have much data to allow him to be optimistic. He wrote that the possession of such a steady faculty of attention is unquestionably a great boon. Those who have it can work more rapidly and with less nervous wear and tear. However, and here's the big but, I am inclined to think that no one who is without it naturally can by any amount of drill or discipline attain it in a very high degree. Its amount is probably a fixed characteristic of the individual. And I commented elsewhere that if there were an education system that could train students to develop attention skills, he said that would be the education par excellence. But he didn't know how to do it. And living in Victorian Boston, he didn't have much help. So he ends on a pessimistic note. And I hope that is not thwarted research in this area, but I was really quite astonished to find oh, about a year and a half ago when I was with John Cohen, a cognitive neurophysiologist from Princeton, who spent his life studying attention. He said there's basically been no research on ways of developing attention skills above normal. And what are the brain correlates? What are the behavioral correlates? What are the benefits, if any? What downsides? I find that astonishing, because attention is so obviously important. If it's plastic, that imp the plasticity of attention is so obviously important. Impaired attention is so obviously detrimental. How that fell through the cracks, I think there are reasons, but I find them very weird. <laughs> so we failed. Introspection, the first person observation of mental events remains at purely a level of folk psychology. We've made, made no progress in uh, developing attention skills, and judging by the in the epidemic now of ADHD, it looks like we may be taking giant steps backward as a culture as well as those who specifically have ADHD. But just because we've failed, does that mean that every civilization on the planet for the last 5,000 years has failed? There are many who are quite happy to assume so. That is, you know, if we didn't do it, I mean, after all, who could have? Which is kind of quaint, but I think rather outdated now that we do actually have telephones and we have a lot of material in English and we can actually fly. So 2,500 years ago, this individual Gautama, the Buddha, he took, like Galileo, he took something that had already been developed. In Sanskrit, it's called samadhi, which means exceptional states of attentional focus. And there were disciplines for developing that that were probably very old at his time, 2,500 years ago. We expect at least 500 years, because according to the accounts we have of that time, they were very well developed at his time. But it seems that they were taken as ends in themselves. You develop a deep state of samadhi, of deep me meditative calm, focus, mental stillness, luminosity. Lo and behold, it winds up blissful, being blissful. And then you hang out. <laughs> and you call it moksha. You call it liberation. You say, I'm enlightened. Because after all, there you are, just you know, drinking at the, at, the, at the well of bliss that is not contingent upon external stimuli. Very nice. But what the, what the Buddha, having accomplished these states very rapidly, it seems like he was quite a prodigy, what he discovered is that there was no profound transformation. That if you come out of samadhi, and you're basically back in the same soup that you were before you went into samadhi. And he wasn't satisfied with that. So he, I think, was really a revolutionary. I think the first cognitive revolution really took place about 2,500 years ago. But we weren't, had no part in it. He took these methods of extremely refined focus attention and then apply them in unprecedented ways to exploring states of consciousness 
origins of consciousness, nature of consciousness, and the relationship between consciousness and its myriad objects. And it made this overall statement, since the primary tool of investigation now is not a telescope, not a microscope, not any external technology, but rather the mind itself. As a general rule of thumb, he said, the mind that is established in equipoise comes to no reality as it is. A mind that is truly brought to, brought to a refined, subtle state of balance, especially attentional balance, comes to no reality as it is. So we come back to attentional training, where William James threw up his hands in despair. This was something that was tackled long, long before William James. And there are th three basic goals. A lot could be said about this, and I need to be keep my comments very short for the time being. But first of all, relaxation. The type of attention you develop in meditative practice is not the type of attention that a jet fighter pilot manifests, or even a professional musician or a chess player. When they finish playing chess, flying their jet, they are exhausted. And they need to go get some R&R. &R. And I know that from a professional musician. She's in the San Francisco Symphony, Symphony Orchestra, I believe. She says, after you've been playing for three or four hours, you're tired. If you become an, an adept in the practice of shamatha, the developing attention skills in Buddhist tradition, and you spend four, five, six, eight, ten hours in meditation, you do not feel fatigued. It's not the same. It's coming from a different basis, rather than kind of an ego-driven, ambition-driven, desire-driven, clenching of the mind, you start with relaxation, bodily and mentally, a sense of ease. Out of that pool of relaxation, then you gradually, with a delicate balance, enhance the stability, the coherence of the attention on the object. The mind is well-focused at a single point, and over time it maintains a continuity or co coherence. One can say a, homo a homogeneity of the focus of attention over time. Those two by themselves are not sufficient because you have both of those when you're deep asleep. So you'll get nice and refreshed, but you won't get any deep insights in the nature of the mind if all you have is relaxation and stability. You need to bring in a third factor, and that is I will simply call vividness. But it includes different facets. And if you think of the analogy of a television screen, it, it, it plays out pretty nicely. Brightness, high resolution, and focus of attention. Those three qualities of vividness are all incorporated in that one term. And those three qualities of relaxation, stability, and vividness are the qualities of attention. It's basically your inner technology that then you use to explore, observe, explore states of consciousness. In that type of training, there are really two faculties that you're cultivating. And the Buddhist tradition said there's an enormous amount of plasticity here, both on the upside as well as downside. I mean, these two can atrophy terrifically. The fact, first of all, we'll call this simply mindfulness. This is defined in Buddhist psychology as the faculty of sustaining voluntary attention continuously upon a familiar object without forgetfulness or distraction. So in a way, it's remembering to remember, to remember, to remember, to remember. It's an ongoing pulsing of remembering to remember, reinvigorating. Like William James said, consciousness comes in pulses. And so it's homogeneity of pulses of awareness that keep attentive to the chosen object. One could think that would be sufficient. You develop that and then enhance the clarity and you're home. Except it's really not in practice. And that is, if you should develop just mindfulness, it's like having a storehouse full of jewels and no person to guard the door. So if somebody comes in and steals all your jewels, you don't even notice. And so this meta-attention, this is a subcategory of metacognition, this is specifically our faculty, which I think you can all quickly identify does exist. The ability to monitor the quality of your own attention. Now, in Buddhism, there are very specific things to monitor for. As there is stability and vividness, two qualities of attention to be cultivated, there are the opposites, two qualities to be attenuated. The opposite of stability is excitation. The mind is fragmented. The mind is distracted. The mind is roving. The mind is compulsive. It is the function of meta-attention, as you're sitting quietly, engaging in this attentional training, to recognize as swiftly as you can, when has your mind become distracted? Now, in all likelihood, that's going to be, in fact, I think in 100% likelihood, that's going to be a retrospective, retrospective awareness. Ah, I see that a moment ago I was out to lunch. I was trying to focus on my breath or something else, and I was thinking about pizza. But I'm not now. And so, in fact, as soon as meta-attention clicks in, you're already halfway to the cure. And then you want to stabilize in that. Likewise, when you start getting dopey, for any of you who have ever meditated, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. 
It's called a nodding acquaintance with meditation. <laughs> Where you've lost the clarity, so you may have a lot of stability, because you're falling asleep. <clears throat> and so it's the function of meta-attention in as close to real time as possible to detect is the mind, specifically attention, falling into either of these two imbalances. Either laxity, where the mind is with, withdrawing into itself, losing clarity on the slippery slope to falling asleep, that's kind of an implosion, or is it falling into excitation, which is kind of an explosion, the mind becoming fragmented and going outwards. That's the core of the training. Now, what's the all, overall epistemic value of this? What's, what's it good for in terms of understanding the nature of the mind, mental phenomena, mental processes? A great scholar and contemplative from the Tibetan tradition from the 15th century, Tsongkhapa, writes this, I think, quite, quite illuminating analogy. He writes, in order to examine a wall tap tapestry in a dark room, if you illuminate it with a, a radiant, steady lamp, you can vividly examine the images in the tapestry. But if the lamp is either dim, corresponding to laxity, or even if it is bright, flickers due to the wind, corresponding to excitation, your observation will be impaired. Likewise, in order to fathom the nature of any phenomenon with penetrating intelligence supported by unwavering, sustained, voluntary attention, it's interesting, you actually used William James's term, you can clearly observe the real nature of the phenomenon under investigation. This is especially important for the mind, since the mental phenomena themselves, as these subjective qualitative events, cannot be directly observed, at least never have been, by studying the brain. You're studying tissue. You're studying tissue, you're studying electrochemical events, but the qualitative aspect of the mental phenomena themselves is nowhere in sight any more than it is when you study behavior. You may as well be studying behavior of a robot. But now problems. Is metacognition so straightforward that you just kind of observe the mind, you take it out and look at it as an object? William James, again, was anything but, but naive here. He said, no subjective state, whilst present, is its own object. Its object is always something else. The act of naming them, whatever the subjective state may be, has momentarily detracted from their force. So if you're angry at somebody, you're angry, I'm angry at this bottle of water, for example. Oh, that bottle of water is too cold, it's too hot. And I'm getting angry at it, and then suddenly I notice that I'm angry. In that very moment that I'm detecting, I'm attending to the phenomenon of anger arising in my mind, in that very moment, anger is already being attenuated. So it's retrospective. That anger, right in the exact moment that it's occurring, focus on the bottle of water that I'm so angry about, is not focus on itself. It's a retrospective, kind of short-term memory, one could say. But William James was not alone in observing the problems that also John Searle has pointed out in his book, The Rediscovery of the Mind. The Buddha himself, in a, in a, in a, in, in a, in a discourse attributed to him, called the Jewel Ornament Discourse, he, write, he states, didn't write, but he did state, the mind cannot observe itself, just as a sword cannot cut itself and a fingertip cannot touch itself. Nor can it be seen in external sense objects, for example, the brain, or in the liver, or any, any external, phys ex external object outside of the body, nor can it be detected in the sense organs. You don't see visual images in the eyeball, for example, or you don't see sound in the auditory cortex. That's interesting. It looks like he just jettisoned metacognition. A great philo Buddhist philosopher, Indian Buddhist philosophy from the 7th century, comments in a way very similar to John Searle's writings in this regard. The actor, that is the agent, the object of the action, and the action are not identical. In any type of observation, they are not identical. So it is illogical, he writes, to maintain that a cognition apprehends itself. Once again, it looks like metacognition, the mind observing itself, has been jettisoned by the Buddha and by this very notable philosopher and contemplative from the 7th century. Another one from the 7th and 8th century, Shantideva, writes, I think, with a lot of sophistication when he's trying to understand how is it that we not only remember event, but we remember our experiencing the event. So I had lunch with a group of students today. And I remember not only eating the food and hearing the students' voices and seeing them, but I remember being there. I remember that I was experiencing it. So how can I remember something if at the, time, at the time of the event itself, I didn't have two cognitions, one, a reflexive cognition, an awareness of myself, the mind observing itself, and another one of my table companions and so forth. Shantideva explains that in the following way. He says, when we remember seeing a certain event, this could be seeing, hearing, any, any sense, sense modality, 
When we remember seeing a certain event, we recall both the perceived event and ourselves perceiving the event. This is recollection, this is retrospective. The two are recalled in an interrelated fashion without the perceiver apprehending himself during the original experience. So I think they're not two simultaneous parallel modes of cognition. One, I'm aware, I'm, I'm aware of me, 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 and I'm also aware of you, but rather a, an event experience, which retrospectively we tease out, oh, that was me part, that was you part. But it's a retrospective disintegration of a situation experience, an event experience. Awareness of subjective mental processes, such as emotion, in this regard, then, is actually a form of short-term memory. As soon as, you know, as soon as you are aware that you're angry, you're now engaging. Maybe it's only a one-tenth of a second lapse in time, but you're remembering not getting something in real time. And that goes for a lot of other subjective men mental processes. You can observe them, but don't accept, expect to get them in real time. Now, that's not really terrible news. When I gaze at the colors of your of your foreheads, of your clothing, and so forth, I'm not getting them in the real time. Pretty close. But it took some time for the photons to be emitted from your skin, from your clothing, and so forth, strike the retina, and set up this complex set of electro electrochemical events culminating in the visual cortex. I'm not getting it in real time. Now, that's insignificant when you're standing ten, or sitting 10 feet away from me. But when you're gazing at a star that may be 10 million light years away, then it's significant. Because where you're looking, there is no longer a star. It might not, even, not, it might not even exist anywhere. It might have burned out by now. But we're getting the tail end of something that is long-term memory. So astrologers, ast astrologers, astronomers and cosmologists like to think of a gazing deep into the heavens, into galactic clusters 13 billion light years away, as actually looking back in time. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're seeing right now something that actually corresponded to an event millions or even billions of years ago. Oops. OK, then I'm going to speed up. Medic, but I would suggest there is also metacognition in real time. And I'll be very, very brief here. We can come back to it. But for example, when you're having a dream, especially it's most vivid in a lucid dream, where you know you're dreaming, the events taking place are in real time. There are no photons striking a dream eye. So there are many events, mental imagery and a myriad of other events that are, in fact, taking place in the realm of mental experience. But you're getting them in the real time and not just some moments later. I'll skip the next point because of, 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 of shortness of time. And I'll allude now very briefly to a very interesting, fascinating technique for observing mental phenomena. It's called settling the mind in its natural state. In this practice, the quintessence of it rests the attention in the field of mental events. That is, direct the attention to that realm of experience that is mental and nothing else. You can't see it with the eyes, hear it with your ears. The realm of dreams, the realm of emotions, of thoughts, mental imagery, memories, desires, fantasies. You can observe them, but they're not occur occurring in any other space or field of experience. So what the heck, let's call it a field of mental experience. You, you observe whatever's arising there without distracting, without grasping. And then you examine the degree of subject or object participancy in this endeavor, asking yourself, for example, to what extent are thoughts and emotions yours? To what extent are they simply arising? This is so juicy, I can't, can't skip it. Why are we so fixated? Why is science so fixated on the objective to the point that John Searle has made so many times that subjective experience is marginalized almost out of existence? William James, I think, gives us a perfect key here. He says, the subjects adhere to become real subjects. Attributes adhere to real attributes. The existence adhere to real existence. While the subjects disregarded become imaginary subjects, the attributes disregarded erroneous attributes, and the existence disregarded an existence in no man's land in the limbo where footless fancies dwell. Never paraphrase William James. <laughs> Habitually and practically, we do not even count these disregarded things as existence at all. They are not even treated as appearances. They are treated as if they were mere waste, equivalent to nothing at all. That's the bucket in which subjective experience has been tossed by about 400 years of Western science. Skepticism. I'm going to read it through. They're too juicy. They don't even need commentary. Richard Feynman. I think you all know who he is. One of the ways of stopping science would be to do only the experiments in the region where you know the law. But experimenters search most diligently and with the greatest effort in exactly those places where it seems most likely that we can prove our theories wrong. In other words, we're trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible, because only in that way can we find progress. 
Is skepticism confined to science? No. Buddha, very famous quote, monks just as the wise accept gold after testing it by heating, cutting, and rubbing it, so are my words to be accepted after examining them, but not out of respect for me. And as Ken commented just earlier, here's a statement by the Dalai Lama, a general basic stance of Buddhism is that it is inappropriate to hold a view that is logically inconsistent. This is taboo, but even more taboo than holding a view that is logically inconsistent is holding a view that goes against direct experience. One of my favorite quotes from Daniel Burson, a, his, a historian, very distinguished historian, is the author of The Discoverers, comments in his preface, which I think is enormously juicy and should be held in mind for this whole discussion, illusions of knowledge, thinking we know something we've only assumed, and not ignorance, have, has historically proven to be the principal obstacle to discovery. Finally, William James laid out a format for a true revolution in the cognitive sciences, studying the mind by studying the brain, the mind itself, and behavior. This vision of bringing in refined techniques of training attention and turning metacognition into a rigorous mode of observation may actually fulfill his vision. And the synthesis of such first-person and third-person means of investigating the mind may then lead to the long-awaited revolution in cognitive sciences. And that's it. John Searle with us today. Uh, John was educated at the University of Wisconsin, and then he moved as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford, where he stayed on as a Don. After that, he came uh, to Berkeley, where he's been ever since, since 1959, and now the Mills Professor of Philosophy at Berkeley. We're thankful that he's really been a key force in cognitive science for years, and he's also been a very influential philosopher, a widely recognized authority on philosophy of mind, and has authored many important books. I can highly recommend uh, his recent book called Mind and Introduction, A Brief Introduction. Uh, John has described doing philosophy this way. He said once, uh, it's like getting up every morning and running your head against a brick wall. And then you keep on doing that every day until eventually you make a hole in the wall. And that's what he says it feels like. <laughs> and we're thankful he's continued to do that hard work. Fortunately, he wears a helmet. So we're very pleased to have him today to come up and tell us about his views on consciousness. How's that? Okay, terrific. Uh, well, look, um, I'm somewhat uh, at a loss because I was invited to a debate. Uh, but to have a debate, you've got to have a, an issue you're debating, right? Or at least you've got to have a disagreement. Um, <laughs> and I uh, was astounded to discover that I'm supposed to represent something called the West. <laughs> well, it's too early and I'm too far east. Um, but here's, here's my problem. There's a certain irony in this, because I have spent the polemical part of my work and the philosophy of mind essentially attacking every single well-known, influential Western view. Dualism, monism, behaviorism, functionalism, computationalism, dual aspectism. Uh, epiphenomenalism, all of those, I, I don't know, maybe the, the guys in the East make mistakes like that too, but those are the views that I have been attacking. Okay, so there's something, I, I would not wish to be here under false pretenses. I certainly do not represent the West. Truth to tell, I represent only me. And, <laughs> okay, uh, now the second thing is, there have to be disagreements. Uh, to have a debate, and I, I, I got out a paper and thought I was going to write down all the stuff I disagreed with, but it doesn't have much on it. Uh, I, I did disagree with one quotation at the very beginning. It was a quotation from me, taken out of context, <laughs> where I, I'm supposed to say, brains don't matter. That's exactly the opposite. That's the view that I am attacking. That was a common view for a long time, to say brains don't matter. We're just digital computers, and as real hard-nosed intellectual programmers, we don't care how the hardware works. You know, when the computer, uh, the programmers I know, when the, when the computer broke down, 
they were proud of the fact that they couldn't fix it. That's for plumbers. We do the serious intellectual work. And the idea wasn't, Jerry Fodor has said this many times, we just happened to be implemented in brains. That's the view that I was attacking. Okay, now there are some disagreements, though, I think um, uh, uh, hidden in uh, um, <clears throat> the uh, discussion that Alan Wallace so eloquently presented to us. But before I tell you what they are, I want to tell you what I think is the actual truth about the mind and consciousness, okay? How much time do I have? I know as he ran over time, all right? So I'm not gonna be too religious, but I, I, I'm, the most fun part is always when the audience gets to talk, so I'm not gonna uh, uh, take too much time. It seems to me the way to proceed on this issue, as with most issues in philosophy, is start off with what you know for a fact. Now, it's true you might have to give up on some of the things you think you know, but you'd better start with what you have as pretty solidly established results. Uh, pretty solid, basic stuff. If, and it's going to take a lot of argument to talk us out of these things. Now, here they are. There are four things in the study of consciousness. It's, and I, I haven't got PowerPoint, I'm sorry to say. I guess we'll all be forced to that in the end. I, uh, uh, <laughs> Listening to the previous two speakers, I suddenly realized the reason I don't use PowerPoint is very simple. Straight vanity. I want them looking at me. I don't want them, I don't want them looking at some damn screen. Okay. All right. Now, here we go. Four points. Uh, if you can imagine this without being able to read it on the blackboard. One. One. Consciousness is real. It is a real and irreducible feature of the world. And I hope that sounds so screamingly obvious. You wonder, why is this guy telling us this? Well, the answer is because a very large number of very intelligent and well-financed research researchers uh, have been out to try to deny that it's real. Either it's an illusion or uh, it it's really reduces to something else, such as computer programs. And I want to say it is a real and irreducible phenomenon in the world. So that's proposition number one. I'll tell you in a few minutes what it is that's real and irreducible, but I want to get to the, um, uh, to the other three before I forget them. Uh, the second proposition, and this is absolutely fundamental, and this was not known in the way that we now know it for, for a long time, but it's this. Consciousness is caused by neuronal processes in the brain. Everything in your conscious life is caused by processes going on in the brain. Now, that is an astounding fact. You've got a kilogram and a half, about three pounds of this gooky stuff in your skull. It's the texture of English oatmeal. And all of the things you most prize, every single conscious experience you have, enjoying Beethoven or the taste of the beer or pick your favorite, feeling the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism. <laughs> what, whatever is your favorite conscious experience, that is all caused by blasts of neurons firing away in the brain. That is a stunning fact, and it is very important for subsequent research. The single most important project in the biological sciences today, and I would want to say in the sciences in general, is simply this. How, in fact, does the brain do it? How does the brain cause all of our conscious states and experiences? And I have to tell you, we're making some progress. We got a long way to go. But when I first got interested in this subject, I went over to San Francisco and talked to the guys in the medical school and told them, come on, why don't you guys get busy, solve the problem of consciousness? How does it work in the brain? And the general answer was, um, that's not science. As one guy said to me, it's okay in my subject to be interested in consciousness, but get tenure first. Get <laughs> tenure first. And there has been a, a, a seismic shift. It's now possible to get tenure by doing research on consciousness, and that is an important shift in the intellectual climate that we live in. Okay, so that's the second point. Now, the third point is, when I say that consciousness is caused by neurobiological processes, I'm not saying that it's some kind of separate juice that's squirted out by the brain. That's not it at all. It is, uh, it is simply uh, the case that the conscious states you're in are simply a higher level feature of the system of neurons. So the neurons are firing away, but the way they're firing away causes it to be the case that the whole system is in a conscious rather than an unconscious state. And that sounds kind of spooky, but it's very common in nature. If you think of the solidity of this thing or the liquidity of the water, the so solid behavior and the liquid behavior are entirely causally explained by the behavior of the molecules. 
But of course, liquidity isn't something squirted out by the molecules. I can't so, you know, say, here, I'll find you a wet one and we'll uh, look for a dry one. No, uh, it is uh, just the, it's the, st it's the state that the system is in. Now, there are certain disanalogies between liquidity and solidity on the one hand and consciousness not on the other, and that has to do with some of these really remarkable features of consciousness. Namely, it has a first-person ontology. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay, we got three propositions out there. One, consciousness is real. Two, it's caused by brain processes. Three, it is a higher level or system feature of the brain, not of any individual neuron, but of big chunks of the brain. And, and I, I, uh, you can have a consciousness in, in the half a brain. In hemispherectomies, don't, I'm not recommending that you do this, but, the, <laughs> but it's possible to be conscious even with a rather diminished brain. But it is a feature of the system. The fourth proposition is equally important, and that is consciousness as a real feature of the real world functions causally. Now, there's always some guy who will tell you, well, you know, consciousness can't make any difference to the real world. It's just a sort of touchy-feely, airy-fairy thing. How can it actually move anything? You know, I, I think in very terms of very simple examples, you want to see consciousness affect the real world, I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up. Now that's a remarkable fact. My decision caused my arm to go up. And notice a very important point. We'd never say, well, that's the thing about the old arm. Some days she goes up and some days she doesn't. You know, that's not it. It's up to me. It's entirely in my conscious control. Okay, now if you got those four propositions under your belt, I'm inclined to say, well, let's go home because that's, that's really what I want. Those are, that's the message I want to get across. But now let me go into a little more detail and then maybe I can join uh, uh, with some of the issues raised by Alan. And by the way, when I run out of time, I want you to start screaming and hollering. Okay. Um, okay, all right. Now, I said consciousness is real. What is it? Now, it's often said consciousness is frightfully difficult to define. I don't think it is difficult to define. I think we all know what it is. Uh, the definitions we give will not be the kind of scientific definition that you get at the end of the research. That we don't know. But look, take water. The definition of water as a clear, colorless, tasteless liquid that runs in streams and rivers and so on, that's a common sense definition. Later on, you discover it's H2O. Now, with consciousness, we're in the clear, colorless, tasteless liquid stage. But I can tell you the common sense definition that identifies the target. Consciousness consists entirely of those states of awareness or feeling or sentience that typically begin in the morning when you wake up from a dreamless sleep and they continue throughout the day until you go to sleep again or fall into a coma or die or otherwise become, as we would say, unconscious. And on this definition, dreams are a form of consciousness, in many respects quite different from waking consciousness, but nonetheless they have this, uh, there are these uh, feelings of awareness or sentience or experience that goes on. Now some of the striking features of consciousness so described are first it is qualitative. There's a qualitative character to every conscious experience. Drinking beer is just feels different from listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and both of those feel different from scratching your head. There's no question that consciousness has a qualitative character. Secondly, in virtue of this qualitative character, it is subjective in the sense that it only exists as experienced by a human or an animal subject. Now this bothers a lot of people because they have a bad syllogism that goes as follows. Science is by definition objective. Consciousness on your definition is subjective. Therefore, there cannot be a science of consciousness. That's a fallacy. It's called a fallacy of ambiguity. The word subjective is being used in two different senses. This is an important feature of our intellectual culture, the difference between objectivity and subjectivity, so I'm going to take a couple of seconds to explain it. You need to distinguish between the epistemic sense of the objective-subjective distinction and the ontological sense. Epistemically, a proposition or a claim is said to be objective when it can be established as a matter of fact independently of people's feelings and attitudes. A proposition is epistemically subjective when it can't be. So to take an example, if I say Rembrandt was born in 1606, 
that is an objective matter of fact. If I say Rembrandt was a better painter than Rubens, well, I, I find it hard to imagine anybody, anybody disagreeing with that, but all the same, it is a subjective matter of opinion. But in addition to that distinction, the epistemic sense of objectivity and subjectivity, there's an ontological sense. Most of the things in the universe exist regardless of anybody's feelings, mountains and molecules and tectonic plates. But there are an interesting class of entities that are important to us, namely our conscious states. And they only exist as experienced by a human or animal subject. And for that reason, they are ontologically subjective. Their existence is subjective. Now, here is the point of, of uh, belaboring this. The fact that a domain you're studying is ontologically subjective does not prevent you from getting an epistemically objective science of that domain. You can have a science of consciousness. I'm always amazed to read philosophers who say it's impossible to have a science of the subjective. Uh, but all you've got to do is go on a university bookstore and pick up any textbook on neurology. And these doctors, they have to deal with patients who are really suffering. They can't think, well, you know, uh, philosophically it's impossible uh, to explain. <laughs> uh, they, you know, the guy's really depressed. You've got to do something about it. So they, I mean, this is a case where you're trying to find an epistemically objective science of, an, of a subjective domain. Okay, now we've got subjective, qualitativeness and subjectivity. A third feature, which is amazing, is unity. And Immanuel Kant made a big deal out of this with his usual gift for catchy phrases. He called it the transcendental unity of apperception. And in, uh, and in the brain sciences, it's called binding problem. But basically, here's the point. I don't just hear the sound of my voice and, the, and feel the pressure of my shoes against the floor and the taste of the water, but I have all those as part of one single unified conscious field. Now, these three, qualitativeness, subjective, and unity, I talk as if they're different, but in fact, if you think about it, each implies the next. You can't, have you can't have qualitativeness without subjectivity, and you couldn't have those without unity. There is a fourth feature that, so to speak, you get for free, but it's absolutely crucial for the evolutionary functioning of consciousness, and that is intentionality. In intentionality is that capacity that the mind has to represent objects and states of affairs in the world by way of perception and belief and desire and the emotions and our intentions and so on. We relate to the world primarily through our conscious states that relate us to the world, and those have this remarkable feature of intentionality. Uh, by the way, uh, intentionality has no special connection with intending. Uh, that's just one kind of intentionality, along with belief and desires and so on. The reason we use this word, as in most of the confused words we have in philosophy, is we got it from the Germans. Uh, in, in German, intentionality doesn't sound like Absicht, so we're stuck with, with intentionality, but it just means directedness or aboutness. It's got no special connection with intending. Okay, so here is our, uh, uh, here is our domain of investigation, these four propositions. And here is, uh, I've tried to give you at least a brief definition uh, a brief ex explanation of what consciousness is, what its features are, that we need to explain. Now, how should we go about it? And this is where uh, I, I will try to make a context with some of the things that Alan said. Basically, the point about methodology is always the same. Use any method you can lay your hands on and stick with any method that works. If somebody tells you in advance that science has a prescribed list of approved methods, forget it. Just, uh, uh, the wonderful thing about the advance of knowledge is its ruthless opportunism. Uh, it, 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 if you find a method for investigating consciousness that nobody has thought about before or doesn't meet some textbook requirement, forget about the textbook and pursue the method and see if you get a payoff. Now, I, 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 I certainly have no objection to introspection or metacognition as Alan described it, but I do have this worry. I think that the, the, the metaphor of introspection, the idea that we spect intro, uh, gives us a false conception. The model of perception requires a distinction between the act of perceiving and the object perceived. So there's this uh, plastic glass full of water, and then there's my visual experience of that. There's the act of perceiving and the object of perception. 
And I think Alan was saying this implicitly, but I want to make it explicit. You, that model does not work for introspection. There is no way that you can focus your attention on your present conscious experiences without altering those conscious experiences, without altering the total state that you're in. So the model of vision whereby you have an independently existing object and you focus your observation on it, that model doesn't work for introspection. The, we, we do not observe our own conscious experiences. We experience them. And that's why the next expression he used, I think, was better. Uh, and that is attention. You can shift your attention from this part of the conscious field to that part of the conscious field. You, you, you can, at will, move your attention around different parts of the unified conscious field. So I think that the, um, the methodology of using introspection is perfectly legitimate. Why not use anything? But if you have a false picture of introspection if you construe it on the model of observation. It's not at all like observing independently existing objects. Now, the one uh, point of skepticism I would have about the fruitfulness of this in the study of consciousness comes up as follows. Um, he be Alan began his talk very eloquently by describing the achievements of Lewinock and Darwin and, and a number of other great thinkers where you get a payoff. We've now had, as he said, several hundred years of uh, Buddhist introspectionism. What's the payoff? What are the results? And I thought, in a way, he was changing the subject, because the subject is how do you get a scientific account of consciousness. And I thought he gave a very eloquent account of how we'd all be better off if we practiced Buddhist meditation. Maybe so, but I still go home at the end, end of the day wondering, how the hell does the brain do it? How exactly does it work in the brain? How is it realized in the brain? And how does it function causally in the production of my behavior? So the, as I said earlier, use any method you can lay your hand on and stick with any method that works. But if we've had 500 years or however many hundred years, I forget, of using Buddhist uh, methods of introspection, I don't see the payoff. Uh, but maybe there is something that he hasn't told us yet. Uh, that isn't to say you don't get a, you might not get a payoff eventually, but I would feel you're making a big mistake if you think you can forget about brain science and do Buddhist meditation if you want to understand consciousness. We're going to have to know an awful lot about the brain. Okay, now everything I've told you so far, I hope is kind of screamingly obvious. Uh, why then do I have so many, why then am I always argue, involved in arguments? I mean, why is it so many people uh, seem to disagree with me? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. Uh, we are the inheritors of a, an amazing tradition. Uh, it is not uh, a, a tradition that, where I can say that I share all of its main tenets but I will tell you the names of some of the major disasters that have occurred. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, the disasters begin with Descartes. Uh, it, we could trace it back to Plato, but I think it's Descartes who is responsible. And then from Descartes, I, don't, I, I shudder when I to say these, but anyway, you have a, se a s sequence of disasters that includes Locke, Barclay, Hume, Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza, and then Kant, and then after that, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> um, and you have Hegel and a very large number of German philosophers whose names start with H. And I, <laughs> and I, and I will not tell you the entire list. Okay. Now, what are some of the features of this tradition that have blocked our understanding of consciousness? Well, let me mention, uh, I'll I, I mention four briefly. Can I do that? Okay. I don't want more time than Alan got. Okay. I was complaining about how much time he got. All right. <laughs> First, we have this idea that the mental and, and the physical are in two different ontological realms. I think that's the wrong way to think of it. The, what we call the mental, in particular consciousness, is just a biological feature of our nervous, of our, of our biological system in a way that uh, growth and digestion and uh, secretion of bile and photosynthesis and mitosis and meiosis are all biological phenomena going on in the real world. We ought to think of consciousness as a natural part of the natural world. There can't be any question of naturalizing consciousness. It already is natural. 
And, but it's hard for us to think that way because we have inherited this dualistic conception that we live in two different realms. We live in a mental realm and a physical realm, and I am trying to militate against them. I'm trying to get you to see, no, we live in exactly one realm, and it includes consciousness the way it includes digestion or growth. Uh, as my colleague Donald Davidson used, like, used to like to say, we live in one world at most. Uh, <laughs> we do not live in two worlds or three worlds. So we're in a world, and it seems that the most basic features of this world are uh, entities that we find it convenient, not entirely accurate, to call particles. There are the, the basic entities of physics. Some of those are organized into systems, most of them, where the boundaries of the system are set by causal relations. Some of those systematically organized particles uh, are, are parts of systems that have a heavy uh, carbon molecules in them. They have a heavy carbon-based molecules containing a lot of hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And some of those have evolved over evolutionary time, roughly speaking, five billion years. That's quite a long time. And they have evolved into our present plant and animal species. And among those species are some that have a special kind of organic structure, the neuron, and some of those uh, us, and certainly the higher animals, are conscious. But that's the basic story of how consciousness fits in with the rest of the world. It is caused by and realized in neurobiological systems, and it is a result of, uh, uh, historically speaking, of a very long period of biological evolution. Okay, that's, I used to think that was the only mistake. If we could just get people out of the dualistic assumptions, then we'd be home free. But there are some other assumptions as well that I want to call your attention to. Another assumption that we make that's mistaken is we have a mistaken conception of reduction. And a lot of a very good scientists like to assure me, science is reductionist. Science is reductive. We've got to reduce everything to something else. So the liquidity really doesn't exist. It's just uh, molecules rolling around on each, uh, on each other in a random fashion. And solidity doesn't really exist. It's just the vibratory movement of molecules in lattice structure. Now, what's going on here? Well, it turns out there's several different senses of the word reduction. I listed in a book I once wrote, I listed half a dozen different senses, but I, I won't go through it here because we don't have, a much time, uh, have that much time. But basically, I want to say this. You need to distinguish a causal reduction where you find out the causal basis of something. That is, the reason that this thing is supported by this uh, is that there is a causal operation of the movements of the molecules. So you can give a complete causal explanation of solidity in terms of the movements of the molecules. But in addition to causal reduction, where you show that something is entirely caused by something else, um, you have in our tradition, we make a lot of this, ontological reduction where you say A is nothing but B. Uh, the, the A type of entities are nothing but B type of entities. Reduction is a peculiar kind of identity relation. It's the nothing but relation. Uh, so we can say uh, that solidity of the table is nothing but vibratory movement of molecule uh, motions. Uh, and uh, the liquidity of the water is nothing but random movement of molecules over each other. Now here's the point. Typically in science, we make an ontological reduction on the basis of a causal reduction. If you get a complete causal account of liquidity or solidity or genes, pick your favorite, then we will say, well then, the liquidity or the solidity is nothing but the, reduced, uh, the reducing phenomenon. And to do that, we make a kind of redefinition. We say what matters about solidity is not how it feels, but the underlying structure. You carve off the surface features and throw them out. And that's not a trivial move. It's that that enables us to say, the glass in the window is really liquid. A stunning claim, if you think about it. I'm not sure I believe it, but chemists I respect assure me that that's really the case. The glass is really liquid. Now, we might make this move with consciousness. We might say, well, look, forget about how it feels. We're going to talk about the underlying neurobiological structures that cause the feelings. 
but we will be reluctant to do that precisely because the point of having the concept of a consciousness is to identify the surface feature, the touchy-feely, subjective, qualitative stuff that I have been talking about. And so, whereas we're perfectly religion to get, we're perfectly willing to get rid of the surface or subje the surface features of solidity and liquidity, and do an ontological reduction on the basis of a causal reduction, we're much less willing to do that with consciousness, and for a very good reason. You still need a concept to describe the qualitative, subjective character of your experiences. Now we might, as with glass for some medical purpose, just as we now say glass is liquid, we might say, well, this guy is really feeling a pain, though he doesn't know it yet. It hasn't reached the threshold, uh, but he's got a terrible pain. You can, we got our brainoscope on him, and we can see. The brainoscope sh shows clear the guy's in terrible pain, and the guy says, I don't feel anything, and we say, don't worry, you will, because uh, we know uh, that he's got this terrible pain. We might get to that stage. We might treat. Um, a pain the way we now treat solidity and liquidity, but it seems to me unlikely. The whole point of having the concept is to name the subjective uh, character, is to name these qualitative subjective states. Okay, now I'm going to stop because I want to save plenty of time for discussion. Let me just summarize uh, what I've been saying. The right approach to consciousness is to be completely naturalistic about it, is to treat it as just a part of nature and explore it as you would explore any other part of nature. Introspection seems to be one possible uh, approach, but I certainly wouldn't use that by itself. On the contrary, I'm convinced that the great advances are going to be going to come when we understand how the brain works. Thank you. Okay, those are our two presentations separately. Now we're going to have a little um, discussion together. Um, so I, I think what we'll start with is, uh, before questions from the audience, uh, let Alan have a bit of a rebuttal. I think he has a few um, remarks to make, and then uh, after a little interchange, then I'll ask for some questions. I'm looking steadfastly at my lo uh, clock this time. I'll try to be far more obedient than I was in the past. So I'm, I will stop within 10 minutes. OK? That's the rules of the game? Um, or you make it shorter if you like. Yeah, maybe if you direct a question. How about we five? Have I, can, I can do five. Better. I can do even less. So, um, not all your points. Oh, no, no, no. No, there, there are many points, but I'd like to focus on the only one or two. Um, and I think it's really the primary point where I think we differ is that in terms of, of methodology. I mean, there are a number of ontological issues, and I would like to shelve those. I'm not really interested in pursuing them right now. But when you come in today and, and you have in a number of your writings, use any technique that works. I'm all for that. We do have direct access to mental phenomena. We don't just infer them. We immediately experience them. And in fact, there are quite a number we can observe, especially any of you who have had experience in lucid dreaming. You are speculating intro. You're speculating into a domain that is not a physical domain, your body is paralyzed, your physical senses are all shut down, you are looking at a space of the mind. And you're observing what's there. Now, it's a special case, but it definitely happens. But it's not only in lucid dreaming. You can do this in meditation, but you actually have to practice it to find that out, like anything else. Mathematics, physics, you don't really learn it without doing it. So if we use anything that's effective, I'm all for that. But what is the status of cognitive neuroscience in terms of consciousness? John Searle mentioned that we, we have a perfectly good definition in terms of first-person experience. The only problem is it doesn't translate at all into the terminology of modern science. You have no definition, scientifically speaking, of consciousness. It does not translate into third-person terms. You call it a brainometer. Another, other people have called it a psychometer. Do we even have, using the neurosciences, do we have any machine that can detect the presence or absence of consciousness in anything? John Searle commented, and I agree with you, that. Human beings, and at least some animals, have consciousness. But how the heck do we know? When does a human being become conscious? First, first month? Second month? We don't have a clue. So we have no scientific definition of consciousness. We have no means of detecting it. We don't even know, as John Schroll has commented in one, in one of his books, we don't even know what the neural correlates of consciousness are. We don't know what the necessary and sufficient causes of consciousness are. We don't really know what it does. And given all of that 
massive no absence of knowledge, we don't really frankly know what happens at death either because we don't know the, the necessary and sufficient causes for consciousness. So we have a lot of illusions of knowledge. I would say cognitive neuroscience has been flagrantly unsuccessful in illuminating the nature of consciousness, its necessary and sufficient causes, its correlates, what it does, and what happens to it. It hasn't worked. Now, does that mean that I'm saying introspection only? No. I'm a, I'm a William Jamesian at heart. But neuroscientists, for them to have any knowledge of the mind, that there are subjective mental events, have to be interviewing somebody. What were you experiencing when I was observing your brain? Likewise, behaviorists, cognitive psychologists, what were you experiencing when you did this? You have to rely upon somebody's first-person experience. The real question is, since that's a given, you'll learn, learn nothing about subjective mental experience by studying the brain alone and leaving it just to the biologist. You have to rely upon somebody saying, I experienced that. So I'm not suggesting introspection alone any more than William James did, but if you marginalize introspection or leave it at the level of folk psychology, which was what has happened since the time of Plato, then why should that be any more effective than skipping telescopes and microscopes for the physical and, and, and biological sciences? So I'm saying rather follow the current of science rather than trying to do something altogether new, leaving it at the level of folk psychology, the direct observation of mental events, and leaving all the professionalism, the expertise, the rigor in studying the brain, where you never observe a mental event, or observing behavior, which is also not a mental event. So it's really more a matter of expanding methodologies rather than saying no brain, only introspection. And in one minute, what's it good for? You might want to live with some Buddhists to check out. Because you don't get airplanes, you don't get technology, you don't get the dividends of external, extrospective, quantitative science and technology, but you get, get a lot of other dividends that are just now beginning to be studied. For example, Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin and others. What are the dividends of doing this type of practice? It's going to have to do with mental, your internal states, developing exceptional states of mental health, well-being, insight, and so forth, which modern psychology has been notoriously deficient in. It gets you up to normal and sends you home. Why should we be satisfied with normal mental health when we're not satisfied with normal anything else? Yeah, I, I have the feeling that instead of giving competing answers to the same question, we're giving non-competing answers to two different questions. Uh, I, I want to know how it works. I want to know how the world works. I want to know how the mind works. And in order to know those things, I have to know how the brain works. Now, I think a lot of what Alan is saying is, uh, wouldn't we all leave a better life if we spent more time uh, meditating? Maybe we would. I don't know. But that's not my worry. Right now, I have a, I don't like these words science and philosophy, but I have a th set of theoretical worries. And I can't see the payoff that has come uh, from introspection. I mean, I, by all means, keep trying. But I don't see, well, if you're going to list these guys, uh, Lewinak and Darwin and uh, uh, Kepler and all, it was this huge list. And they're going to, then I can tell you the payoff from that. I can tell you the great discoveries. What are the great discoveries of Buddhist introspection? Well, it improves your life. That's non-trivial, but it's not the kind of payoff that I'm looking for. Okay, now, uh, Alan said some things now that I do disagree with. He said, well, we haven't really learned anything about uh, consciousness from, uh, a neuro, about, from uh, cognitive neuroscience, from brain science. I think we've learned an enormous amount. Let me give you one trivial example. It's not trivial, really, but it's one uh, exam small example. In my childhood, parents who had a schizophrenic child were made to feel you are at fault. It's your fault that this child is suffering, and you have to be better parents. Uh, also, they were deeply ashamed. It was a kind of scandal uh, in the family. Now, we, kn we know quite a lot about how it actually works in the brain. And indeed, I, I think what is happening is that uh, the whole area of so-called mental illness is moving more and more toward a medical paradigm. We're going to treat uh, me so-called mental illness uh, as a, a problem of brain malfunction. And this, this is <coughs> happening more and more all the time, and we're better able to cure people's suffering. Now, so I think it's, it's just wrong to say that we haven't learned a lot from brain science. The second thing he says, we don't really know uh, when somebody's conscious and when uh, other people are conscious and other animals and so on. I, I think we know perfectly well. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's always some philosopher who will tell you animals aren't conscious, you know, dogs and cats and so on. I want, him, I want to introduce him to Gilbert. 
my, my Bernese mountain dog. Any, <laughs> anybody who knows Gilbert knows Gilbert is conscious. I've had four dogs, by the way. I, uh, Frega, Russell, Ludwig, and Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no, now why am I so confident about <clears throat> Gilbert that he's, that he's conscious? And people will tell you, well, it's just his behavior. That's wrong. I, I might build a mechanical dog that would wag its tail and, and uh, jump up and down. And they say, yeah, but his behavior resembles a human. Not really. Most of my friends, when they see me, don't wag their tails and lick my hands. Um, the way that I'm so confident that Gilbert is conscious is I can see that the underlying causal structure is relevantly similar to mine. Those are his eyes. This is his ear. Which is why Lyndon Johnson got in trouble when he lift those doggies by their ears, because all of us hurt in our ears. We know what it feels like. When I first got interested in this, I read a bunch of textbooks on the brain. I, and one of the things that struck me in one of the textbooks was the author said, cats perceive color differently from human beings. And I thought, have these guys solved the other cat's mind's problem? You know, <laughs> don't they realize the philosophical thin ice that they're on? But of course, they know perfectly well because they can look at the structure of the visual system. If the, I forget the details, but if the cat has a different apparatus for perceiving color, then it's going to produce different color perceptions. So basically, we often know. I mean, I, we, I would be a hell of a, a life if I didn't know that you were conscious. And I, I, and I think I'm making inference here. How do I really know? Alan says I can't really tell for sure. Don't worry. You're conscious. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I think that, that um, well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I keep groping for some uh, a sort of disagreement between us. And I have a suspicion that maybe there's a hidden agenda in what he's saying that I really uh, disagree with, and that's the idea that we don't have to take seriously consciousness as a natural phenomenon, part of our ordinary biological life, uh, that maybe it is in some separate <coughs> metaphysical realm. I reject that. I think that view has been disastrous. Okay. Um, at this point, I'll see if there's some questions for the audience, from the audience. Uh, I'll start with you. Let's say you know what consciousness is. Let's say that my grandfather has left me a health care directive that says, pull the plug, terminate the life support when I'm no longer conscious. He's lying on the hospital bed. He can't talk. He can't communicate. He can't reliably squeeze my hand to say yes or no or blink. How do I know this question? Yeah, okay. Now, this is a very good question. And this enables me to make a point I wanted to make earlier. The way that we have now of detecting consciousness is uh, essentially a common sense, and we don't know how to deal with uh, very strange uh, kinds of cases. But now this is where brain science has come in. If we had a complete science of the brain, if we had a perfect science of the brain so no, and we knew exactly the difference between the conscious brain and the unconscious brain, I'll give you one brief example that's close to home. Uh, on January 4th, 1999, I was skiing too fast on an icy run, KT-22. Uh, I remember skiing fast, and the next thing I knew, I came to riding up again in the lift. There was a 15-minute period of my life when I skied down the mountain, made some sort of conversation <coughs> with people. Uh, and I, how, how did I do it? Was I conscious or unconscious during that period? I don't know. These are like the, the uh, Penfield uh, cases where the, the woman has an epileptic fit while she's playing the piano, and she keeps right on playing even though she's unconscious. She goes into the petit mal case. She goes into unconsciousness and continues to play the piano. Now, uh, how do we tell that she was conscious or unconscious? We don't know enough about brain science to know the answer to that. But th the point is this. That's not a question you're going to answer by introspection. You can't get the patient, you can't say to the patient, introspect more carefully and tell me if you're really conscious. I, we're, that's a scientific question, and it's going to have to have a scientific answer. Hey, um, yes, back here, sure. Loudly. Loudly. Is that directed at me? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, well, pain is a form of consciousness. And when I first got interested in this, I thought, well, the brain stabbers ought to get busy and figure out how it works. And I thought pain must be easy. Vision, that would be hard, but pain must be easy. And I went out and bought a half a dozen textbooks <coughs> on the brain. And by the way, uh, it's an interesting literary experience. I bought the $60 jobs, big ones, and sat down and read them. And, and at that time, I was having debates with people in literary theory. And I discovered there's an interesting literary property to these texts. They don't tell you until you're on about page 250 that they don't know how it works. Uh, so you will learn enormous about the about architecture of the Perkin J cell and, the, and, the, and the, the carbon rings and serotonin. And I spent many happy weeks in the, in the hypothalamus. I recommend it. <laughs> but it turns out pain is very complicated. I thought pain was going to be simple and easy, and it's not. It's an extremely complicated uh, phenomenon, and we understand it probably less well than we understand vision. There's an enormous amount of research on vision, and we now understand quite a lot about vision. Yeah, but the thing is that for pain, we have found medicine that can uh, interact, interact with it. Like, uh, do we have medicine? We have medicine, yeah. Yeah. Pain, yeah. Yeah. Hands pain. And do we have any, by any chance, we have anything, you know, that we know that can influence consciousness, like stop it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I would say you just gave me an Example, uh, the, by, we influence consciousness by giving somebody an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. And we influence it fairly dramatically by giving a general anesthetic and make, that makes them unconscious. And by, as far as I know, nobody knows how it works. Nobody knows uh, exactly the mechanism by which the general anesthetic works. Last time I asked an anesthesiologist, that was the case. And of course, if you think that, well, there's some doubt about whether or not uh, brain processes of chemicals can affect consciousness. I test it every evening by ingesting a substance called Cabernet Sauvignon in rather <laughs> larger quantities. And there isn't any doubt that, that this has an effect on my consciousness. So we're affecting consciousness all the time by these biochemical and chemical means. Okay, uh, question over here. So, Professor Cyril. We're looking for something that sort of identifies something positive about introspection. And it occurs to me that in the West, as a scientist, we've produced a lot of good things from the other perspective, but we've also had some downsides. Nuclear energy is great, but atomic bombs aren't so good. I'm not aware that Buddhists have started any wars. Would it qualify if introspection leads to a more peaceful world as something that would be substantive to you? Well, as I, I, I guess that's directed at me. Um, as I said earlier, it's important to know exactly what question we're trying to answer. Uh, would we be better off in a more peaceful world? Of course. Uh, if we elected a Buddhist president, would there be more likelihood of a peaceful world? I don't honestly know uh, 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 enough about Buddhism. Uh, I mean, I, I don't hear a lot about Buddhist divisions attacking other countries and so on. So maybe uh, they are more pacifistic. But, uh, but I, that may well be the case, that, that uh, the world would be a better place if we all practice meditation. It's just that's not the question I came here to answer. I came here to answer what is consciousness and how does it fit in with the rest of the world. Adam, did you? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what amount of correlation would convince you of causation? So the, uh, the Cabernet which alters conscious experience through a physical mechanism. Um, or the fact that you can, using um, certain types of brain stimulation with magnetic fields, you can alter cognitive processes directly, or just lesions. What, what would convince you that, or is it even possible, but what would convince you that when you die, you're dirt? I, well, for us to know that, that when you're dying, you're, which in, just let me translate that into my English, that, that consciousness vanishes without a trace. Just like the, like the, the, the fluidity of water of, you know, vanishes if you destroy all the H2O molecules and the like. Uh, there would be a very straightforward way to come to that conclusion, and that would be to, to identify, to know with certainty, what the necessary and sufficient causes for consciousness are. We don't. We don't even know what the necessary causes are. As John Searle has commented in one of his books, we don't even know what the correlates of consciousness are. So I don't at all mean to disparage neuroscience for unveiling an enormous amount of knowledge about the mind, about schizophrenia, mental illnesses, mode of perception, memory, and so forth. 
we come back to the basic issues. What's the nature of consciousness? No definition. Can we detect it? No. What are the necessary and sufficient causes? Don't know. So I really see John Stroll's position here as faith-based. That is, we don't know, but he has faith in future generations of neuroscientists. They will figure it out, and it's really their problem and not for the philosophers. Yeah. But when, when we say that, or when, when John Searle says that consciousness is not spooky, he's, you're not a property dualist, but he's a feature dualist. He'll say that there are higher order patterns of neural activity. I don't doubt that. But exactly why would you equate those with consciousness? Because actually they're invisible. You, you can identify higher order, pa higher order patterns of neural activity. That's no problem. But why should you equate them with consciousness or states of consciousness? Merely because they're simultaneous? That's very weak. It's not logically or empirically rigorous. So we don't know what consciousness is. So as soon as we know what the necessary and sufficient causes are, when exactly his, his dog became conscious? Was it in the first month? The fourth month? Fifth month? When exactly? What were the necessary and sufficient causes? We don't know. I think we'd have no debate about abortion, really, because these are a lot of good-hearted people on both sides of the fence who don't want to be murderers. When exactly does a human embryo become conscious, and specifically human conscious? The fundamentalist right doesn't know, nor, does the, nor do the scientific materialist or the brain scientists. They don't know, therefore we're all shouting in the dark. So we'll know something about what happens at the end of life when we know what, what are the necessary causes for the beginning of consciousness in any embryo, human or other, otherwise. And we don't know. Here we are. Uh, can I just... John, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Jump in, uh, uh, the answer to that is uh, we know an awful lot. Uh, we know what consciousness is because each of us is a conscious being. I, I don't have any problem identifying consciousness. I live it. Uh, secondly, we don't have any problem detecting it in other people. We know its functions. It has a rather large number of functions. For example, one of its functions is when I'm thirsty, it enables me to uh, grab a glass and drink out of it. So we know what consciousness is because we live it. We know its functions. We have no difficulty, in, except in extreme cases, in detecting it in other people. Now, we do not know exactly how it is caused in the brain. But when we hear that, that we don't know how it's caused in the brain, do, you, do we hear that as a call for despair? No, that's a call for further investigation. I want to tell you something. We've lived through this issue before. I'm sorry Chuck is leaving, because I'm about to make an important point. Uh, we, lived, <laughs> <laughs> we lived through this issue before about life. A hundred years ago, probably on this very spot, people had tremendous debates about life. And there was a school of, of philosophers and biologists who said, you can never account for life by naturalistic uh, chemical methods. It, you have to have an élan vital. You have to have some kind of a life spirit. It is hard for us to recover to, today the passion with which that issue was debated a century ago. Now, we, we just, it's, the issue's been solved. Now, I think we're in a similar situation about consciousness. How does the brain do it? We don't know. So what's the right attitude? Uh, look at our navels and introspect, or go in a lab and figure out how it works. And I want to recommend both. <laughs> you, yeah. I thought you raised your hand. Of course we know what a, a, a precondition for consciousness is. And it's a neuron, right? If you don't have a neuron, you don't have consciousness, and you can take, you can say that in embryology, and you can certainly say that in, in a lot of in, in, a, in a lot of different situations, including the medical one that our that our colleague alluded to. The other quarrel is um, Buddhists aren't the only only religious faith tradition of long of, of um, long and passionate and intensity that believed in training the mind, and of course my tra tradition of the Talmud, which has nothing to do with introspection particularly, but has to do with puzzles and games um, as a way of concentrating attention, but has nothing to do with it. It's just merely another way of training the mind. But I wouldn't suggest Talmudic study as a way to answer the question of where the, the neurocorrelates of consciousness are. No, it's no, an no. interesting thing. And it, it, makes us, it's more, it makes the world, I think, cheerier and better, though <laughs> not less violent, but um, the cheerier <laughs> and better, right? So that's a good thing, too, just like goodness and might. And, and um, so those are the two quarrels, I think, with, with what you laid out. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think, um, and I don't think we could, we, could, we could talk about the function of religiosity and the goodness of the world. And, and I would, you know, one, one could cheer that on. And one could say it's a good thing. But it's a different sort of question than the questions that, that we're really engaging with here, which is this, with this completely curious puzzle about what you have when you have a brain thinking and how we, how we decide that the thing is, is, is going on and what's really going on there. 
I want to ask them the question, which is the next thing that happens is we aren't, of course, just in qualia. We make choices, moral choices. And that, I want to, I want to push you a little because I just finished reading your New York Review article, which is a wonderful one, about Koch's book. And, and he stops at a certain point when he identifies the location and takes us where we've been. But what would you imagine the next step would be about moral choices within the qualia? Well, okay, we solve the con problem of consciousness. Somebody says, now solve the problem of moral choice and free will. Uh, I, would, I would say it's a quarter to six. Um, and and any, anything I say will be hopelessly inadequate. And the single most boring thing a lecturer can do is give a footnote to his other works. Um, but I, there is an article by me called um, uh, Free Will is a Problem in Neurobiology. And you can find it on the web. Uh, on, look on my web page, and I, there is a chapter in this book I just published. But I think it, it's a non-trivial question. Once we've solved the problem of consciousness, we're on the way to solving the problem of free will, but we're not home yet. That is a tough one. I, and I, well, if you, we don't have the time to go into details, but anyway, I appreciate the question. Uh, just, just, uh, this question just came up in my mind. Uh, for both of you, do you believe that free will is a, is a binary thing, or that it's something that can be uh, developed, <coughs> or that it can exist to, to very, very extent? Um, and what, what kind, of, uh, kind of mechanisms or characteristics would there be of you know, this spectrum of free will? What kind of characteristics would there be very little of exist? Who is this directed at? Who first? Uh, <laughs> okay, look. Why do we believe in free will? You see, I don't, I, I, this is a nice pen, I like it, but I don't think it has free will, right? Now, why not? What's the big deal about us? Well, the big deal about us is not only are we conscious, but we have a very special kind of consciousness where we make free, rational decisions, or so we think. Uh, that is, we make decisions which are such that we have a sense of alternative possibilities open to us, and we think, having made the decision, all the same, we could have chosen otherwise. We, I voted for this guy, but I could have voted for that other guy. Now you might say, but why couldn't that be an illusion like any other? A lot of people tell you color is an illusion. Why couldn't free will be an illusion like color? The problem with free will is you can't get rid of the presupposition. You're stuck with a presupposition of free will. You go into the restaurant, and they, it's an Italian restaurant, they say you want the, the spaghetti or the veal. You cannot say, look, I'm a determinist. <laughs> que sera, sera. And then just sit back. Because if you do that, if, if you do that, that is only intelligible to you as an exercise of your free will. You see, I gave a lecture about this in London, and a guy got up and said, yeah, but if determinism were proved to be true, would you accept it? And I pointed out to him, what he's saying is, if it were shown that there's no fresh, free rational decisions, would you freely and rationally decide to accept that? <laughs> See, notice he didn't ask, you know, if determinism were shown to be true, would your mouth open and affirmative noises come out? He didn't say that. He, wanted, he asked me about free rational decisions. So we're stuck with free will. I'm, and there are a lot of cop-outs. The cop -out, fa famous cop-out in philosophy is called compatibilism. And a lot of famous philosophers hold it. Well, free will is true, but so is determinism. All our free actions are totally determined, but they're free anyway, so don't worry about it. That's no good. That's a cop-out. We have to face up to this, and we do not have a solution. Uh, and I point the ways to possible solutions, but I don't know a, a solution to it. Yeah. I'm going to make a one line over here. We don't know that neurons are necessary. Uh, people in artificial intelligence wonder whether they couldn't develop a sufficiently sophisticated program that generates consciousness. It could be silicon-based. For us, neurons is necessary, but not necessarily for every. Do plant, uh, uh, insect eating plants, might they? I don't know, but neither the scientist. Do amoeba? I don't know, but neither the scientist. So we don't even know that. Coming here, free will, is a boondoggle because of Christianity. All of the great founders of the Scientific Revolution were Christians, with, the, with hardly any exceptions, until you get really pretty much in the 18th, 19th century. And free will is an enormously weighty issue in Christianity, because if you don't have free will, and you're either going to heaven or hell, then somebody else did it to you forever. And that's just too awful for anybody but a Calvinist to consider. <laughs> that you could be pre-programmed to go to hell forever 
for something you had never, no choice. So the, the weight is enormous. And this is presuming, along with Descartes, you got an independent agent of a consciousness, an ego, a soul, immortal, Im immortal, immutable, carrying on from, life, from this lifetime to the next lifetime. And now does that poor little critter, for which there's no em empirical evidence at all, have, fr have this so-called free will outside of the great mechanism of the physical universe that Descartes was assuming was there. Well, he was wrong on everything. The universe is not at all like a machine. Just study c contemporary quantum mechanics. It ain't like a machine at all. Non-locality reigns. And so that's one problem. The notion of there being an independent ego that's got the free will, well, that's been shot, shot down the toilet by, by neuroscience and psychologists and Buddhists for 2,500 years ago. So while freedom of will is this great big dead chicken around, hanging around the neck of philosophy ever since at least Descartes, really going back to Augustine and so forth, it's never been a big issue. Do we have free will in Buddhism? Of course we don't, in the sense of having a at completely autonomous decision-making process that's not influenced by circumstances, or that's somehow operating out of the, outside of a causal nexus. So it's not binary in Buddhism. You ask that question, and in Buddhism it's not binary. We can ask, are there circumstances under which I make decisions that are foolish, detrimental to my own and other well-being? The answer is yes. Are there occasions when I do so less, when I make more intelligent decisions, more wiser decisions? And then we ring in the issue of plasticity. Are there, are there ways that I can train my mind so that I can make wiser decisions that are truly of benefit to myself and those around me for the world at whole? And can I more and more avoid decisions that are coming out of delusion, self-centered craving, delusional hostility and aggression and hatred? And there is the great big opening. Not do I have free will, but can I be freer and freer and freer along a path of, a path of transformation such that my choices, my, 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 my conscious choices, can be more and more guided by intelligence, wisdom, and frankly by altruism and compassion as well. And there, there's a whole gradation. Yeah, well, I disagreed with uh, one of the... Well, uh, I disagreed with the idea that uh, uh, it's only Christianity that stuck us with a free will problem. I, I don't suffer from uh, uh, much Christian angst. Uh, maybe I should, but I don't. Uh, but I do think there's a serious problem about free will. And it isn't uh, the question, are our decisions influenced by our background and history? Of course they are. The question can be stated quite succinctly. Is it the case for every human action that the antecedent causes of the action were causally sufficient to determine that action and no other, such that there's no case where the agent could have done otherwise? If that's true, determinism is true. Are there cases where the antecedent causes are not causally sufficient, where given that the agent freely chooses, uh, chooses one thing, he could still have chosen something else? Now that's the issue, and that issue remains. Forget about Christianity and, and the fact that we're all influenced by heredity and environment. Of course we are. The, there is still a serious question. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure it's the case that there are many more questions to address, but I think it's time for us to have our reception. So I, I invite you to continue discussing these issues uh, together. And I want to finally thank, again, Alan Wallace and John Searle for coming here today. Thank you.